There has to be some common sense. Yes, sir. They have the car stopped at 10 and Grant, Michael Biden. We still don't know who pulled the trigger. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Police Off the Cuff, Real Crime Stories. I'm your host, retired NYPD Sergeant Bill Cannon, a 27-year veteran of the NYPD. You know, folks, we've covered so much of the uh, Lisk case, the Long Island serial killer case, Rex Hewerman, and we've gotten some really good guests to speak with us. And tonight is no exception. I was very fortunate enough to to be able to book and reach out is probably top secret, his number. Somehow we got his number. Sheriff Errol, Errol Toulon from the Suffolk County Sheriff's Office. And you've seen him on a number of TV shows. He's uh, He's been interviewed by Newsday. He's been interviewed by CNN during this investigation. And he's always a voice of reason, cool, calm, and collective. I don't want to give him a big head, but he probably already has one already because he's a very accomplished individual. And I remember when I first was watching this case as it unfolded, I was thinking, you know something? They're talking too much. There's too many people telling everything about this case. Started out with District Attorney Ray Tierney, and I was like, he just unfolded the entire case. There's nothing left. That 32-page bail application, I was like, you know, 13 years of an investigation all wrapped up in 32 pages. How is that possible? And then, of course, we had Rodney Harrison, the former NYPD chief of department, going to be go down probably as one of Suffolk County's greatest police commissioners. Uh, if this case goes forward and we get a conviction, which it, I think it totally looks like we will, he's done a fantastic job. And, of course, then we have the state police. They started this task force. The FBI brought in. And whoever thought of bringing in the Suffolk County Sheriff's Office. Oh, how are they going to help with this investigation? And that's one of the reasons we brought Sheriff Errol Toulon on tonight, because he's going to tell us how. And, you know, a lot of the experience from this has New York City written all over it. I'm sorry. You see my NYPD cap? It has New York City written all over it. And you know something? Many police departments across the nation, they follow the NYPD about if the NYPD does it, it must be right. So we're going to follow what they do. And as a result, they're extremely innovative. And I think the same thing goes for corrections. Because Sheriff Toulon worked, I believe it was for 25 years on Rikers Island, went through the ranks. So he knows how to talk the talk. But guess what? He can walk the walk, too. You know, He was a corrections captain in the, the equivalent of their ESU. Uh, I guess they would call it the emergency response team, corrections emergency response team. I mean, there's no more uh, crazy a job than that in the world, probably, unless the actual ESU out on the street. But inside, it's just as bad, and you have to be just as well-trained, and you have to know when to use force, when not to use force. Very difficult job. And Sheriff Errol Toulon, uh, that is included on his resume. So I think this is going to be a really interesting show because we're going to find out What's going on inside with Rex Ewerman? What was he like when he first came into the jail? How is he now? What's his day-to-day -day routine? All of these questions that I have, we're going to ask. And But before I keep talking about Sheriff Errol Toulon, I'm going to bring on my co-host tonight, retired NYPD sergeant, professor, law degree, and if you need to have your confession heard, priest, Father Mike Geary. Bring him on. He's not really a priest. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I only but, play one on TV. Yeah, on TV, hey, that's buddy. right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the show, Mike. I think this Thank is going to be a real exciting one. So we're not going to keep people waiting forever. Uh, he, he's he's sitting. He's ready. He's willing. He's still cool as a cucumber. Gonna, but I'm going to bring him on. <laughs> Sheriff Errol Toulon. Sheriff Toulon, well, welcome to the show. Thank you both for having me on. Welcome. Love the intro. I can tell you, I want to be a New York City police officer now. After you see that, and you know, in fact, Rodney Harris was was in it like twice. I, I uh, did notice him. 
Yeah, it's pretty cool, right? Yeah, my, my son actually is an editor, and he made that for us. So uh, you try Great. to keep it in the family, you know? Great so, job. Uh, uh, Sheriff, one of the things I, I wanted to know, and I think a lot of people want to know, and of course we hear a lot about this, this task force that was started, because this case goes back uh, to 2010, even earlier, if you count uh, a, a missing person, uh, Karen Vergata, that went missing in 1996. But we don't know if all those things are connected. But when Rodney Harrison came to Suffolk County from the NYPD, he used the term task force. And I don't know. What, it's, I, I'm giving him credit for it. Could Ray Tierney have been involved in it, too? doesn't matter. But it, it was successful. And part of this task force, of course, was the Suffolk County detectives, uh, the FBI, the state police, uh, the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office investigators, and they bring in the Suffolk County Sheriff's Office. How did you feel and what did you feel when you were invited to sit at this table? You know, first, very honored. You know, I, Rodney Harrison is a legend in, in New York City, especially with the police department and his work with the community. And Ray Tierney, a uh, great prosecutor. And both of them, when they both took office, even before we started with Gilgo, when they first took office in the first week or two, had, uh, we met uh, separately. And they both said that we want to collaborate and include you in everything. And then, you know, a couple of months later, uh, the task force was formed. And they said that they wanted us to come in because we had established uh, a human trafficking unit in our jail in late 2018. And so we were building on questions that we would normally ask new admission females uh, based on what we learned from other law enforcement personnel or even the media before this task force was created. But once the task force was created, we were now able to actually uh, really specify some of the questions without giving away that we may have had a possible suspect in mind. And so the collaboration that both uh, Rodney Harrison and Ray Tierney, uh, including us, really made us feel good as far as that partnership, but also as a, as a vital organization to contribute uh, to hopefully catch, catching the individual. That's great. You know, I know that, you know, in uh, Rikers Island, and I mentioned this off the air, they have some of the best databases for certain things that are used by NYPD detectives. For example, the gang tattoo database, invaluable in identifying a potential perpetrator. And that's kept, of course, by the uh, correction officers at Rikers Island. In addition, because you're around inmates 24-7 for however long they're there, you have that opportunity to establish a relationship and trust, if you will, that they may trust a correction officer to tell him something that they might not tell a police officer or an investigator. You're, you're right. And one of the benefits that we have uh, when you're working inside a jail dealing with inmates is the fact that when the police arrest them, they're only in the precinct for a couple of hours, taken to arraignment. And if they're remanded to the custody of, of some correctional uh, whether it's a commissioner or whether it's the sheriff, they're with us for days, weeks, and months. And so the rapport bills, whether it's a, uh, a phone call, whether it's food, whether it's getting them to the clinic, whether it's the gym or religious services or even visits, you know, we start to establish these relationships. And then there are a lot of individuals that are afraid that they, won't, that they may be hurt because either they're not in the strong gang inside the jail uh, maybe they know some information that, that someone may not want them to know. And so they will come to a correction officer or a supervisor uh, to let them know what's going on. And that's sometimes how we're able to establish confidential informants inside of our custody. That's fantastic. Mike, you have any uh, questions? No, I was just thinking um, because I've, I've known a number of correctional officers and I work with a uh, buddy of mine, Dr. James Scott up in Albertus Magnus. He was on Rikers Island for a number of years. And um, the uh, Connecticut also has a tremendous uh, gang intelligence unit. And some of the younger officers are in it. And it's a great career path for anyone who's interested in corrections because it's a specific unit and you're gathering intelligence and working within the organization and without the organization in terms of other organizations and law enforcement other correction organizations. It's a fabulous tool because um, it, it always needs to be updated. 
you're 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 contributing a lot. You're not just babysitting this person. You're getting information. You're passing it on. Some of it may be invaluable in a homicide investigation. It's a it's an excellent career path doing that sort of gang intelligence unit activity for a correctional officer. You know, you're you're 100 correct. And you know, there's so many other things. You know, we're involved in financial crimes because we know of individuals that are committing financial crimes during COVID. There were so many individuals collecting unemployment while they were incarcerated using phony names and phony social security numbers that we were able to uncover and also give to our police department and district attorney to follow up on the investigation. The human trafficking unit, the uh, the opioid crisis that's plaguing us, you know, how so, uh, opioids, especially fentanyl, is worth almost uh, 50 to 75 more t- times more than what, what that street value is. And so there, there's so much intelligence. And if you have the right staff, the right databases, and the right investigative tools for the, for the staff that's working there, you know, you can really help keep our community served, safe with great law enforcement partners. That's, that's, that's amazing. And when we get back to that, I just want to play a little bit of this here. And could soon face charges in the murder of additional victim, Maureen Brainerd Barnes. There, there are certain times where we have evidence, but evidence to be brought to court to be able to charge someone and hold someone uh, for a crime is a little different. So we want to make sure, you know, and the district attorney and the police commissioner have been very methodical in our approach in uh, addressing this and wanting to make sure that we were pretty concrete with everything that we presented to the courts that we can hold this one and there was no technicalities. Toulon credits a multi-department task force comprised of officials from the Suffolk County Police Department, Suffolk County Sheriff's Office, New York State Police, and the FBI with tracking down Hewerman and gathering an abundance of evidence against him. But I I can tell you that, you know, each part of the task force brought a different different piece to uh, what we were collectively doing together. And so I think that was probably the success and the expediency of how a suspect was was, uh, arrested and in custody right now. After the first sets of remains were discovered more than a decade ago, Toulon says a task force was established but quickly disbanded. There was a, a task force with the FBI on it, joint with the Suffolk County Police Department. And for reasons that I don't understand, uh, the FBI was removed from that task force And clearly the case went stagnant for so many years until the current district attorney, the current police commissioner, uh, myself, and also the the New York State Police and the FBI were able to work together collegiately to really make sure that we can do our best uh, to really uh, solve this case and at least bring a suspect uh, into custody. You know, again, Getting back to the partnership, and, and, and I spoke last night with uh, Pat, uh, Patrick Ryder, uh, the Nassau County Police Commissioner, about, you know, what happened to this case. You know, in 2010, they had the information about the green Escalade, the Chevy Escalade. They had the information about this huge ogre. That's how he was described. This huge ogre of a man who visited Amber Costello's house, not once, but twice. And apparently, and and I don't know how accurate it is because I don't have the case folder to read the actual statements, but David Schaller, who was whatever you believe, the boyfriend, the pimp, he lived in the same home as Amber Costello. According to him, he gave that information to the police. So we just, everyone, not just us, but Everyone out there was saying, oh, it was corruption. They didn't act upon it because this, that, and the other thing. The most important thing is that it was corrected and there's been an arrest made now. But that's the big question, uh, Sheriff Toulon, that many people that listen to us and many people out there in true crime land, they want to know the answer to. You know, that's a a mystifying question. Uh, At that time, especially from 2012 to 2014, I worked as the assistant deputy county executive for public safety under County Executive Ballone. And when the task force was removed, I, I didn't understand it. Uh, I was still uh, really, my, my, I was very green in Suffolk County government and Suffolk County uh, politics and not understanding not only who the key players were, but why 
things were occurring. And, you know, there was no explanation as to the removal of uh, the FBI, which, you know, is, is very, very crucial and was uh, very helpful uh, in this invest investigation, the, the players that were part of this task force. But I do not understand why then Chief of Department Burke removed them, uh, why it was accepted by the powers to be, uh, whether the commissioner or anyone else in the county executive had questioned it and why they let that happen. I mean, I think it, it is baffling. And, and you know, people that um, that watch true crime, people out in the public, they just point, everyone's pointing. I mean, of course, there's craziness out there. People are saying, oh, Chief Burke's one of the Gilgo killers. You know, he's one of the serial killers. And uh, and especially when you partner that up sort of uh, with the Shannon Gilbert case, where everyone in, in true crime land thinks that her, her death was a murder, and oh, many people do. And the explanation, of course, from the Suffolk County Police Department is that she walked off and they believed that she drowned. And there's, there's conflicting information even in the autopsy. The Suffolk County Medical Examiner said that uh, the results of the autopsy are inconclusive. And he did not rule it a homicide. But then uh, the attorney, Johnny Ray, or John Ray, I don't want to use Johnny if that's not John Ray, who represented the uh, Gilbert family, hired former uh, office of the chief medical examiner, medical examiner, uh, Michael Bodden, who basically ruled the same thing, but he said she had a broken hyoid bone. So I don't know how he found that, yet the uh, Suffolk County I ME mean, did not. So I, I don't know, but yet he gave the same opinion, but I, it's inconclusive. Uh, Mike, what do you think? Yeah, Billy, the shame of it is that, like you said, you had this information, you had some solid information. And, and as Sheriff Toulon said, you know, you're you're dealing with these these groups of uh, people who ha all have their expertise. The FBI, you know, you've got Suffolk County, you got Nassau County, even state police. And if you can't work together, it doesn't matter how wonderful your um, your task force is or how many how, the great people you have or how well funded it is. Everyone has to work together. And for the FBI to either be disinvited or to leave or however that happened, it's a huge shame because they have deeper pocketbooks. They, they probably have greater technological ability. They have the ability to work, you know, for, for the task force without going to other state local governments. They can go all the way across the, the United States if they need to get information from a field office, you know, a thousand miles away. And I think that's the big shame of it. But I think Rodney Harrison was really correct earlier when he said that, you know, we'll get to the blame game, you know, later. You know, the fact is we have a, a viable suspect in custody. Um, the case looks very good against him. And, um, you know, the, the days of reckoning or the day of reckoning, if there's anybody still around that should be punished, they'll be punished. But uh, it, the problem is it's fodder for the people out there who want to jump on the conspiracy theory bandwagon and really take action. And when they do that, they they take away credit that belongs to people like Rodney Harrison and Sheriff Talon, because you've got these you've got these people with who can get along with the FBI and everyone else. And they're and they've got a great amount of data that they have access to. And, and if you don't include them or they you disinvite them and all their abilities, you know, you're left by yourself. And we know originally somewhere along the line, the very beginning of the investigations in 2010, that the detective who was assigned to the case was still catching cases and did not have any help. And that's very dispiriting for the people, you know, in the task force. You know, one, and, you know, uh, Professor Mike, you are so correct when you talk about, you know, uh, Rodney Harrison's vision of bringing everyone collectively together because you get to learn what other resources that they have, uh, you know, working together when you present some, some a key piece of evidence that you may be able to uh, include with their task force. And, you know, I, I think that their camaraderie is, is something that's unprecedented in something so quickly and where we were able to not only identify uh, a suspect, but then really hone in to make sure that everything, as I said earlier, you know, in the previous interview, that we were able to give to the courts shows that, you know, we're going to be able to prove that this is the guy for three of the four, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, eventually charge him on that fourth case. 
is extremely important to us because when Ray Tierney and Rodney Harrison uh, spoke to me about collaboration, they never said, we're going to solve the Gilgo case. They said, we are going to work together to make Suffolk County a safer place. This is one of our focuses, but we're working together on everything that's going on in Suffolk County. And, you know, for me, um, I call myself the old guy because I've been in my office a lot, little longer than both of them. So I, I've dealt with other people and Stu Cameron, Jerry Hart were excellent, but I do think that there was some outside pressures that were slowing them down from moving forward. But, you know, Rodney Harrison and Ray Tierney having that New York City experience and wanting to get the job done is why where we are where we are today. You know, Sheriff, I think you're so correct with that. And like uh, uh, Professor Mike said before, is that I was a little bit astounded when um, Rodney Harrison came in. And one of the things he said, I believe, in his Newsday interview, and I'll refer to that, is that he was very surprised when he did an overview of the case and he found out that there was only one detective assigned to the case and he was still catching other cases. So that is a clear sign that there wasn't any immediacy to this, that they, and he needed to inject that into the case. And by establishing again that task force, and I don't want to beat this to death, but it was a great idea. And you bring everyone together, and like in a major homicide investigation, which is this, of course, was the most major, you sit everyone down, you sit all the players down. What do you got? And you let everyone talk, and you leave the egos at the door, and you take what everyone says as very important, and you work on what everyone says, the direction, and establish a direction. And obviously right away, because it took them six weeks to find out the owner of that green Chevy Avalanche. Six weeks after not knowing it for 12 years. Incredible. And again, I, they speak about the box. We spoke about that last night with Commissioner uh, Patrick Ryder, the Nassau County PC. The box. And we can oversimplify that. But if anyone's ever worked with cell phone technology, you've got to be a miniature scientist yourself. It's not an easy thing. So when they oversimplify it and say, yes, the box, the Massapequa Park, the uh, calls were made from Freeport. He made calls using the victim's cell phones to their family from Massapequa Park. It hit in Manhattan. He must have an office in Manhattan. All of these things we all know when we read that 32-page synopsis of 13 years of work and we say, oh, this case was a cakewalk. It, it, there's nothing about this case that was a cakewalk. But when you put competence in charge and you put a task force together and you put very competent people together that are motivated, great things can happen. And as you said earlier, no egos and no silos, which is so important uh, in everybody feeling comfortable to share every little piece of information or not. You know, and in some task force, I'm sure you, you both have you know, you may you, they may only share with one or two partners in the task force, and not the entire task force, because someone wants to get the credit. For me, it was a matter of just doing our little part to assist the other four partners, because we, you know, we had a very small role, but we were included because we do have sex workers. We did have a we do have a unit that interviews sex workers, going back to 2018, and so that expertise that my staff had was able to establish now as we move forward, because we have someone in custody, interviewing all the sex workers that are in, currently in our custody, all the sex workers that were previously in our custody, all the sex workers that may never come into our custody, who other sex workers may know that there's a trust factor to say, you can speak to Sergeant so-and-so or correction officer so-and-so because they're not going to hurt you. And so we're able to gather information, whether it's good or bad, or, or I should say not good or bad, but good or not useful, we can then at least present it to the task force because that's where our expertise lies. You know, Sheriff, I believe also that the uh, the sex workers, escorts, if you will, people that used to advertise on Craigslist, I believe it's a very small community. And that community speaks to each other. And as as you can testify to, when that community gets incarcerated, even for a very short period of time, they may want to spill the beans. They may want to tell something. They I Look, when I was on the street, even in homicide or in, in anti-crime, prostitutes on the street were excellent witnesses. They would give us information. And historically, that is the case. And people don't always realize that. And even in this case, a lot of people, like, they get upset when you call uh, these people 
what they do. This is this was their job. They were sex workers. So we got to call it that. We can't, you know, put a sugar coat on it and say, oh, they, you know, they visit people or they're going on dates. No, this is really if you the common denominator is really it's it's prostitution. But that's a very unpopular word these days. So you make it a little softer by calling them sex workers. But again, it's a very dangerous profession. It's a profession that many or most of these people are addicted to drugs or alcohol or some other thing to uh, anesthetize their pain and perhaps their life isn't going so well. And so using all of those things is what we call in the law enforcement world intelligence and getting information that they have undoubtedly have tons of intelligence. And, you know, I, I asked you earlier, and I'm going to ask you again now on the air, how many people have come forward and you don't have to actually even give a number, but people will come forward that say, Oh, I went out with Rex Schumann and this is what happened. And if the person survived, then we know that Rex Schumann didn't kill every person that he, you know, he went out with or every uh, sex worker that he called or, or every, you know, everyone that he met with and nothing happened. But perhaps that didn't happen a lot of times. I don't know. What you, what's your feelings on that? You know, from our, our interviews, there were very, very few that claimed to have met Mr. Huerman. And even the, the ones that did make those claims, we're still vetting to make sure that the times were accurate, the dates were accurate, um, what they're saying is accurate. And so all that information is presented to the task force to see um, the accurate or validate the accuracy of what their statements are. And you're so right, many of these women are addicted to uh, drugs. They have uh, mental health issues. And you know we've learned in our investigation because uh, over the course from 2018 until now, you know we've interviewed uh, over 7,000 women. So interviewing that many women um, and really interviewing period, not interviewing them specifically for uh, Gilgo. Since Gilgo, since he's been arrested, we've interviewed a little over 100 women both incarcerated and not incarcerated. But what we've learned from these women are how they communicate with each other, uh, with using the last four digits of a phone number to say that 0001 is a person that will tip very well, or 0001 is an individual that's overly aggressive or uh, has certain features during that particular act. And you know, if a woman says that a person is aggressive or uh, violent or whatever the case may be, you have to take it that these women are engaging in a lot of acts. And if someone is making those claims and we're still, like I said, vetting uh, to validate these statements, you know, it, we have to take them on their face value because, <clears throat> excuse me, they are um, women that engage. They know it's violent. They know it's aggressive. They know someone that's a good tipper and they know someone that's not. Absolutely. Mike, you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, Billy, people don't realize it. Thank you, Sheriff, for saying that. And Billy, thank you also, because a lot of people who may not be in law enforcement don't realize how valuable speaking to prostitutes are, speaking to call girls are, because they're out there late at night. They see a lot of guys who are just drunk. Maybe they're just looking for a good time. They also may see a lot of guys who are really sick, perverted deviants. And they, they see cars coming by looking to pick up girls. They might not know the license plate. They might not look at the license plate, but they see the names. I'm sorry. They see the faces. They give. They get descriptions. Um, and if you actually just treat them as human beings and and give them at least a little bit of respect, because we are all God's children, um, you can actually get them to talk to you. And you can. I knew, the, I knew the priestly side of you would come out <laughs> in this interview. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, one time, the reason why I feel this way is one time years ago. It was Easter Sunday morning, like four o'clock in the morning. I was doing midnight and I was exhausted. And I was in a bodega and a, pro, a, a, a sex worker walked in a, couple, a second behind me. And she actually offered to buy me a cup of coffee because she said I looked terrible. So, <laughs> you know, and I'm looking going, OK, I must look really bad. And my partner was out in the car. He wasn't even paying attention. But uh, it kind of, you know, gives you a little lesson that these are. Are, 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 are they're just they're like everyone else but you know but by the grace of god there goes i so they are people to talk to you can warn them about people in the neighborhood they could warn you about people in the neighborhood there are some guys who are acting strangely or or something like that 
they are a font of information. And Sheriff Tulan is fabulous in doing this because you people might overlook them, but they have they're out there. They're, you know, eyes on the ground, you know, from like the time of dusk to dawn the next morning. They are eyes on the ground. And if they see something, um, you know, and they trust the officers, they may give you some information. It's an unta- usually it's an untapped font of information and that's ba- badly overlooked. And it's terrific that this task force took advantage of this, you know, corpus of, of intelligence information and used it. That's really excellent. You know, one thing uh, a lot of people think that most of the victims of human trafficking or these sex workers are gang affiliated and only 6% of the victims are actually gang related and 36% of the traffickers are gang affiliated. So, you know, it's not a gang affiliation uh, type of mentality. And unfortunately, you know, these women find love in all the wrong places or these men will then uh, introduce them to drugs or continue to give them drugs. And when these women want to get away from them, they say, well, I want the money for the drugs. They don't have the money. So they're forced into this lifestyle of doing things. And then, you know, one other thing I like to reiterate is the difference between a human trafficker and a drug dealer is the fact that once those drugs run out for a drug dealer, you know, they have to go and they have to get a supply. They have to you know, pay people with these women. They just keep, keep getting used, unfortunately and tragically, over and over and over again. And there's no end game. With a with a trafficker, well, you know, sheriff, I think that you know, I'm not going to get. Into, we'll get into this a little later on, but I know you have all kinds of programs within the Suffolk County Jail that not only addresses what's going on in the jail, but what's going on in the outside community. I was really amazed to see that because it's so important. And again, I think that you had mentioned off the air that one or two of your programs is being used as a national model the how correctional programs should be run. And that that's a fantastic thing because who thinks that, oh, a jail, that's just a place you want to stay away from. You don't want to go near a jail. But if you can be a success story and maybe even turning around some of these women and getting them off drugs, uh, getting them out of that life, then that's that's a huge thing because then they won't be you won't be, they won't be visiting the jail any longer. Right. You know, uh, with our human trafficking unit, not only is it to help these women identify who the traffickers are, but we're connecting them with resources in our community so that they can get the help so that when they leave our jail, they are a little bit more successful when they came in. 85% of the men and women, this was a study we did in 2019, 85% of the men and women in our custody are returning back to our community. So we wanted to formulate a plan to how do we help these men and women who are returning back, mental health issues, substance abuse, um, housing, employment, seem to be the four key things outside of not having a birth certificate or even uh, a, a driver's license or any sort of identification, which is really necessary when you're seeking some, some sort of employment. And so one program I'm extremely happy of, and uh, it really, because we can never do this on Rikers Island, I was very happy that we're doing this. This is now our third year is our START Resource Center, which is an acronym for Sheriff's Transition and Reentry Team. We start reentry within the first seven to 10 days of someone's incarceration with my staff meeting with them and creating an IRP, which is an individualized reentry plan to see where they're at in their life and where they wanna be. Not where I want them to be or my officers, but where they wanna be. And so we establish where their needs are. And Suffolk County is a big place. We're 1.5 million residents, we're 10 towns, where are the resources they'll be returning back to in their community? So what we do is we have these community service providers coming into our facility, working with these men and women. And then we, when they're discharged, that continuation of care continues in the community they're returning back to. So when they're, ret- when they're discharged, we provide transportation either to a safe location where a loved one or family member or friend can pick them up. We provide uh, 10 days of non-perishable food which we're, ga- we're gaining through donations. We have um, uh, clothing for business attire. Uh, we have a center where they can uh, uh, search for jobs and we'll connect them with jobs. If they leave and they uh, gain employment and they were to lose employment at some point, they can come back to us and we'll help them gain employment if they fall back into some sort of substance abuse. But we're also not only helping the men and women leave our Riverhead and Yapang facility, but anyone returning from state prison to Suffolk County, 
anyone that's been engaged in uh, the criminal justice system in another state that now resides in Suffolk County, we're helping him or her also. So we're trying to take a more holistic approach, helping the family members when someone's incarcerated, if they need employment, working with the Department of Labor and engaging with the children of the incarcerated because we don't want generational behavior where, you know, when I was a young captain on Rikers Island, we had uh, sons, fathers, and grandfathers all spread out in one of the, you know, one of the 10 jails on Rikers Island. And that generational issue, and sometimes even a, fa a, a mother and son, and we wanted to stop that. So we're addressing the children, the spouses, and then the incarcerated individuals themselves. You know, Sheriff, uh, Toulon, I think yourself and Mike Geary should start a religious uh, Father Errol and Father Geary because you guys are saintly. Yeah, I don't think you'll let me in, but you guys are both two, saint, two saintly guys. And uh, if I put on a thing, you're going to hear confessions. There'll be thousands of people showing up. I'm going to go to a quick commercial and we'll be right back, folks. Folks, this is Police Off the Cuff. Real crime stories, if you like real crime, true crime from a police perspective, then you're in the right place. And if you're not subscribed to us, go on our YouTube, hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, and ring that bell. And if you want to contribute to us, we have a Patreon with three different levels, and we also have a YouTube channel members of five different levels. And you see the folks in the green font, there are subscribers, our friends, and our Police Off the Cuff Real Crime Stories YouTube family, and we really appreciate all of them. You know, there's so many things we could talk about here, but I want to get back to the reason we were here. And of course, this is the Gilgo case. I'm going to play a, a little a bit of this and then we'll we'll talk about it. For divorce from Huerman just yesterday, they were married for 27 years. Rex Huerman is being held in Suffolk County Jail tonight. Sheriff Errol Toulon runs that facility. He has visited Huerman in his cell three times and he joins me now. And Sheriff, I very much appreciate your time. Thank you uh, for being with us. And I understand police have been searching Huerman's family home for days now. They've re removed dozens of bizarre items, a glass and case doll and, and many others. Uh, and we're learning tonight that they've been operating on the theory that Huerman committed the murders in his home uh, and then disposed of the bodies on that beach. What more are you able to tell us about all of this? You know, first, thank you for having me on, Erin. And I think it's most important for the viewers uh, to understand the fact that every piece of evidence that could be gathered, whether it's from the storage containers or from his home, could be valuable not only to the murders that he's currently being charged with, but more importantly, if we can connect him to other murders, whether they were in um, uh, New York or other locations. And, and, and is it, do you think it's possible there are, I mean, I understand anything's possible, but other locations outside of New York? You know, we're not going to exclude that possibility. And so I think as we gather evidence, now that we have actual DNA, we can compare it to other crime scenes that may have occurred in other locations which could be very suspicious and where he can be possibly a suspect. So Sheriff Toulon, I understand that Herman is obviously in your, in your jail uh, and he's currently spending all of his time alone, 60 square foot cell, monitored while he eats, has a television but is not watching it. Is there anything else that you can share with us about uh, the conditions of his uh, current jail confinement. We have you here live, so I'd rather ask you those questions yourself. Sure. Um, many people want to know what is Rex Ullman's demeanor inside the jail. What is Rex Ullman's routine inside the jail? What, if any, visitors does Rex Ullman get? How is his um, mental health? Uh, now that he's been incarcerated, now that the gig is up, and I know he cried to his attorney how innocent he is, but uh, what people don't understand, not in this business, that every single person in a prison is 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 innocent. Once you learn that, you're on your way to nirvana, you know? So uh, I don't know if you can remember all those questions I asked you. Love The first one, what is uh, Rex Schumann's day-to-day -day life like now? Sure. So if he doesn't have court, uh, which is next court date is September 27th, you know, he'll wake up in between six and seven. He'll be served breakfast. He receives the same meals. Uh, he'll have breakfast, lunch and dinner, but he'll wake up or have breakfast. It's the same meal that's offered to all the inmates in our custody. Uh, whatever the dietitian and the nutritionist have on the menu will be the meal that he will receive. 
then um, we have medical staff that visits him at least three times a day uh, for not only his medical, but mental health status to make sure that everything's okay. Uh, he does uh, participate in various activities. He goes to recreation. Uh, recreation he goes to by himself. Uh, anytime that he has to move anywhere outside of his housing unit, uh, we stop all inmate movement in our jail so he can get to and from a location safely. Uh, we don't want any inmate to attack, the, attack him uh, to build up their own street credibility. And I want to make sure that Mr. Hureman has his justice in the courts and not in my jails. Uh, so outside of recreation, he'll go to a yard. He has the opportunity to shoot basketball hoops. He can walk around the yard, which is what he does most of the time. He does not uh, do pull-ups, push-ups, dips, or anything like that, which he can do if he wanted to do. Uh, he has the availability to have visits. Um, he's only had one visitor uh, known to him outside of uh, his attorney. Uh, we've been we've chosen to keep that person's name confidential because. We don't want the media thrust thrust to go to him and um, uh, his relationship with Mr. Hureman should be uh, private unless that person wants to come forward and say, you know, I'm, I'm someone that's visited Mr. Hureman. He has not had any family members come and visit him. He does have the opportunity to make phone calls. He goes to the law library. Uh, he has the opportunity to go to our rehab unit where he takes out uh, several books that he can read. He reads uh, several uh, newspaper publications. He can watch TV, he showers, he uh, has his own personal hygiene habits. And really, it's the same day to day that any other person that's incarcerated in our custody has. So, Sheriff you, uh, Yulon, uh, Toulon, excuse me, uh, now that we're hooked up with you, can we get an interview with uh, Rex Hewerman? <laughs> uh, you can request an interview with Mr. Hewerman through his attorney. That was um, supposed to be funny. You know? oh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you may be the one he'll say yes to, but I know he has said no to several other media uh, requests. Hey, Sheriff, could I just ask you a question about uh, Rex Sherman is, and his day-to-day -day activities? Sure, please. Um, is, he, when, is he ever uh, allowed to be alone without like a correctional officer nearby? Is there any sort of, uh, any sort of verbalized threats against him where he would actually probably need like an escort to get food, an escort to go to uh, to go to that down the hall, an escort to get something to eat, an escort to take a shower, an escort to do um, some recreation time. So there are two correction officers that are assigned to him. And okay. we also add an additional camera into his housing unit. Uh, anytime he does uh, come out of that housing unit, He's escorted by two correction officers and a supervisor okay. um, just to ensure that nothing is, is going to happen. And if something doesn't, we're, we're a jail. And we've seen uh, people across the country from Whitey Bulger to Larry Nasser to Jeffrey Epstein uh, all either be seriously assaulted or killed. And that's the one thing that we want to prevent. And so to have the level of supervision, shutting down the jail, ensuring that there are extra personnel on the escort. And, you know, listen, he's charged with some very violent crimes using his hands for the most part. Uh, we want to make sure, that even though he has not had that tendency towards men, that if he was to attempt that in my custody, which I would strongly recommend him and no other person in my custody do that to my correction officers, uh, the appropriate actions would be taken. Okay, absolutely. Duty Ron, thank you so much for the $20 super sticker. Thank you, Sheriff, for all you do. I would love to know the thought process with you meeting with Rex Hewerman and your executive staff. Much respect from a retired NYPD detective warrant squad trip team. You know, great question. So, you know, as a sheriff, I tour my facility uh, frequently, and I talk to all my staff. I talk to all the inmates. So it's not unusual for me to, to see you know, listen, this is a guy, this is history making for Suffolk County and Long Island. Someone that's been on the run for almost 13 years, at least that we know of, that's finally in our custody. And I, my tours there are to ensure that the protocols that I put in place, my staff are following because I don't want, you know, we don't want pictures of Rex Hureman in jail getting out to the media. We don't want any unnecessary conversations with any staff that aren't assigned to that housing area to occur between them and Mr. Hureman. So any conversation should be between the supervisory staff, the correction officers working there, uh, and him if they need to have that conversation. 
And Sheriff, what I, I, I asked earlier, what is his mental state? Is he, does he talk? Does he laugh? Does he, or is he in his own world all day? Is he got the thousand yard stare? What, what does he, what does he do all day? So, you know, there, there's definitely been an evolution from, uh, you know, July 14th when he came into our custody. Uh, you know, he slept a lot on the bunk. He was still under suicide watch, which meant he had a, a suicide garment. He didn't have sheets in his cell. He didn't have anything that he could tie around his neck uh, to cause self-harm. But as, as time has gone on, you can see now he's engaging in purchasing commissary. He's reading books. He's going to, uh, you know, he's having religious services. He's having um, uh, commissary. He's watching TV. And, you know, he's, he's acclimated to, uh, you know, jail life until, uh, you know, his, his case comes to, to trial or court. And what you talk about, he, I think, believe you said on another interview, uh, he gets one hour a day of exercise. What does that entail? Is it just walking around the yard? Right. He can walk around the yard. He can shoot a basketball. He can do pull-ups, dips, sit-ups. He can jog in place. He can do jumping jack. You know, he's by himself. He's not in general population. And we're not mixing him in when it comes to recreational activities. So, you know, everything that he does, um, he has to do by himself. And, you know, a 60-foot jail cell, that's a pretty damn big area for one person. And is that specifically for high-risk inmates? So 60 square feet is just a typical cell area in New York State. Um, it's He's in a single cell. All the cells inside our Riverhead facility uh, and also our Yapang facility are single occupancy cells. Um, you know, 60 square feet for a man that size when all you have is a metal bunk, a mattress, a toilet, a sink, and a plastic mirror uh, really isn't that much since you're, you know, inside most of the day. Well, my question. Oh, it is a quick question. Uh, Sheriff, you mentioned that he has access to a law library. Are there volunteer lawyers actually helping or is he just allowed access to all the books and he's just free to pull them out and, and look at them? Right. So what, what most jails have, like uh, like New York City, when I worked there and, and here, we have law library clerks, which are basically okay. the inmates that work inside the law library. They're very familiar with assisting other inmates and in how to do particular research on their case. Um, sometimes uh, the incarcerated individuals or the inmates would bring material that their attorneys had given to them so that they can review during that discovery process or as the trial starts to proceed. So really they're on their own with the help of maybe, you know, other inmates that are more familiar with the law library and the access to some of the databases and also whatever information they may be able to obtain from their attorney. Okay. I'm going to play this on the screen. This was a, a, a woman who in 2015 said that she went out on a date with Rex Human and survived and something uh, terribly wrong she sensed. And that's why it didn't go any further than it, it could have. And I'm not familiar with the area and I'm very locationally challenged. Yeah. Like I need a GPS to go home and I could live there for five years. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm, I'm bad. Yeah. So, I, and I didn't have friends nearby in case anything happened. So I asked him if he would meet me in Port Jeff at the steam room because in Port Jeff, it's a small town. I That's knew a the, restaurant? Yeah. Okay. It's a small town. I knew the area. I had friends locally mm -hmm. and people nearby that if something were to go wrong, they could be there quickly. So you do meet with him at the restaurant in Port Jefferson? Yeah. Well, before I met him, I was at Chuck E. Cheese with my sister. And I had said to her, I showed her a picture and I said, hey, this is who I'm going out with tonight. If anything happens, this is what he looks like. So, and I would do that. I, I would do that for every time I did it just for my own safety. Um, no, I think I jumped ahead. So he, he reached out to you. You asked him for a picture. Yeah, because I said I, I wanted to know who I was looking for. I didn't want to show up at a restaurant and be like, who who's meeting me here, you know what I mean? So, and you showed the picture to your sister and gave her the picture. I, I didn't give it to her, I showed it to her on my phone and mm -hmm. I said, this is who I'm gonna be with, so you know what he looks like and who it is. Um, at the time we used fake names, so I couldn't give her a name. Um, and then we met 
we didn't meet in front of his car or where I could have gotten a plate or a description mm. of it. We met directly in front of the restaurant. What did you think when you first saw him? Oh, my God, he's massive. At the time, I was, you know, 24 years old. I was like 120, 130 pounds, hadn't, you know, hadn't had kids yet. And he was a gigantic man. Like, I had to look up at him, gigantic. And it wasn't just his height, it was his weight, it was everything. He was just this huge, very, like, overbearing type mm. of weight. Like, he almost carried his weight to intimidate. Mm. Sheriff, is Nikki Brass known to the Department of Corrections? Uh, yes, yeah, she has been incarcerated with us. And has she told you or any of your investigators this story? So when she was incarcerated, it was prior to the task force being formed. Uh, she has not been incarcerated since. And, um, you know, she has spoken to our investigators. Uh, you know, her, her story, of course, is being validated and, and investigated by the task force. But, you know, as, as both of you know, and you, you are far more uh, informed when it comes to investigations than I am. You know, the amount of evidence, you know, that was seized from the home or seized from the storage containers, seized with various people that have made millions and millions of tips, you know, still has to be uh, vetted and, and looked at and, uh, you know, uh, codified, you know, is so challenging. And so, you know, you know, she's the most vocal of anyone that said that they've encountered Mr. Herman. Uh, she's made a, a quite a bit of the media circuit to um, tell her side of the story. Uh, the one thing that I do see, because I've seen uh, her on several different uh, different uh, media outlets, is the fact that her story has been very consistent. I haven't said, you know, on one, on one outlet she's saying one thing or this seems a little inconsistent with a, a different one. Uh, so, you know, you do have to take her seriously. And I think every woman that makes a claim, we have to take very seriously just until we can positively exclude uh, their story or anything that they may be uh, any evidence they want to present to us 100 percent, and i think that it's important to uh to let that known out there that uh, you're going to be sensitive to whoever comes forward with any information and but you as a, an investigator you have to vet the information and find out if it's true if it's inaccurate what are the inaccuracies because in this business we're in it's tpo time place of occurrence and that's uh that's one of the most important things. And if you don't know the time, you don't know the day, you don't know the month, you don't know the year, it just rips your credibility to shreds. And, you know, when we come across this way and people say, oh, you guys are cops, you're just so hard. No, we're not harsh. This is how people try to impede on our reputation by the same thing. Time, place of occurrence. You don't know that? I can't use you. I'm sorry, you know. And, again, you're interviewing a lot of these workers. And... Of course, it's in the larger investigation. It's hugely, hugely important because, in my opinion, and I'm no expert at anything, but in my opinion, I think Rex Schumann has done more murders in other places than we know about right now. I didn't. I don't think he just started in 2010. Uh, I think he's been doing it for quite a while, and he's been good at it, and he's been good at hiding and covering his tracks. You know, that, that's a, a strong possibility. And one of the things that we find uh, very difficult, even as we interview sex workers, is the fact that we only get them when they're 18 years of age and older. So if, if Rex Heerman or anyone else is engaging with um, sex workers that are under the age, um, we're never going to uh, meet them unless they're incarcerated or have that chance to interview them. Also, there's a great deal, there's a great amount of sex workers that have been injured uh, or through violence or aggressive men who won't report it to the police because of uh, the occupation that they chose. And so unfortunately, those women uh, have not come forward. And that's why, you know, my staff, not only gaining the trust of the sex workers that incarcerated, can now ask those others, those sex workers to reach out to those that may not be in jail and say, you know, who do you know that we could possibly interview that may be able to help us with this and it, or any other cases that we're currently working on? You know, uh, Sheriff uh, Toulon, also, I mean, a huge impediment, and we in the law enforcement uh, business know this, and it might be not popular to 
throw it out there, but a lot of these sex workers have pimps. And pimps are the lowest form of human on this earth, when we all know that, you know. And that also most sex workers, if they do have a pimp, and most of them do, they're terrified of these guys. And that is also an, an, an impediment to an investigation. And uh, detectives and investigators know all of this. You know, and you're, you're right when we talk about how pimps can intimidate and put fear into a woman so that they'll continue to do what, they're, what they want them to do and not report it and not run away and not call a loved one or not even escape from this 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 behavior that someone is forcing them to uh, engage in, and so you know it's very important for for me and my staff to break down those barriers, especially those barriers of confidence and trust, so that they can freely speak to us, and we're able to really get them the help that they need. Unfortunately, you know we do see some that uh, not only return back to the lifestyle, some you know after incarceration will overdose immediately because. They have not been on drugs in, so, in a long period of time. And when they go out, they'll they'll take more than what their body can deal with. And tragically, they'll pass away. So, you know, it, it, it is an unfortunate, uh, you know, situation that these women are in. But we're working very hard to try and change that narrative. You know, Sheriff, you, you're doing uh, an unbelievable job. And I mean, uh, as I said, as I watched this case, like everyone else across this country, I was impressed with pretty much everyone that was, we call you guys talking heads, you know, the talking heads on TV. And I was especially impressed with you and, and just your compassion. And I, you know, people don't understand really what it's like to work in corrections and you obviously thrived in that world, but I don't think I would have liked it. Uh, it was a little bit different for me and, uh, I would have felt locked in myself. Mike, your thoughts. Yeah. Uh, I always thought corrections was the most dangerous job in the world and I would never ever do it. I don't have that nerve. So, you know, anybody who work in corrections, you know, I salute them. I just have a real quick question. Um, Sheriff, when you talked about like, you know, um, you know, interviewing the sex workers and you'd mentioned that you were able to, to verify, I think two perhaps that you thought were very valid in terms of giving you, uh, you know, true information and accurate information about Rex Sherman. Were you surprised that there was only two, uh, given what you what we now know about him, or do you think that uh, what does that what would that tell you that you only can verify two that you actually think are being that actually did uh, meet Sherman? So those two, we're ver we're verifying their stories with the task okay. force, but you know it is a little uh, weird, you know, from my perspective that only two. But mm -hmm. you know, as I said, there could be some that were underage. There may be some that are still engaged in sex work and don't want to come forward. Uh, there could be other uh, uh, bodies out there that we uh, have not looked at, you know, especially in other states. And and so, you know, this investigation is so fluid with so many uh, different things and uh, so many people attempting to uh, give information about him, whether it was his neighbors or his, his co-workers or sex workers. You know, everybody wants to give some sort of information about Rex Herman, not, and not even to mention, as I mentioned earlier, anything that was removed from his home or the storage containers, um, you know, in uh, Las Vegas. It, it's just so much. And, you know, we're all working very diligently uh, to, to peer, uh, parse through this information to see, you know, not only what's valuable, uh, what connects to other cases uh, that we may not even know about or realize yet. Yeah, it, there's there's a mountain of evidence. There's a mountain of things to do still. People always think, oh, the arrest is made. The case is... No, it's not over. It's actually just begun. The, uh, just it goes into a different phase. And so much more work is necessary on this case. So much more traveling. You know, and, and Mike mentioned the FBI. The FBI has offices in every state in the United States. You could even uh, use some of the people in other states to interview people if you don't want to send someone to that state. So yes, this investigation and look, all of the unidentified or the other, the people that haven't been linked to a killer, it's so important for their families and for their souls to find out who the person is who did this to them. Yes, I, I agree with you. And I think that's why 
we are all working so hard and diligently, not only to make sure that we bring justice to the victims and the families, but make sure that everything we present to the courts, every piece of evidence, you know, is something that we feel 100% confident that we can get a conviction on all three of the current charges he's faced with. Absolutely. And, and potentially some of the other bodies there that he hasn't yet been linked to potentially, and maybe he didn't uh, commit those. However, they have to be completely investigated and he has to be either cleared of those and uh, then they still have to find out, well, then who, if he didn't do this, who did do this, you know? And I, when I spoke to uh, Nassau County Police Commissioner Patrick Ryder last night, he said, you know something, he goes, it could be that this became like a dumping ground uh, for others. But I don't know if I totally buy that, though. Uh, you know, it's like, oh, Gilgo, it's a good place to dump a body. You know, I just and when you when you really look at the case also, and we, you talk about Shannon Gilbert. I did a uh, interview recently for People Magazine Investigates. Yeah, I'm a talking head too, you know. And um, I was uh, surprised, and I grew up on Long Island, how far away, and I used to go to the Oak Beach Inn, how far away Oak Beach is from Gilgo. It was like five or six miles. And I was like, wait a minute. So Shannon Gilbert was found in Oak Beach. What made them search six miles away or five miles away to Gilgo? And the point was, I guess, when they found shannon gilbert that was the catalyst to get them to search the whole damn area of ocean parkway and so she in her death she brought this life to this investigation yes and you know then uh police commissioner dormer uh who headed that investigation you know when that whole area started being searched and you had to wonder like how many bodies are actually here how many have been decomposed to the point where you know, maybe we haven't because it's such a marshy area also, you know, are still there. And, you know, why there? Like, why Gilgo? Like, why, you know, eventually, as, as Commissioner Harrison said, you know, we'll hopefully we'll be able to understand not only why Rex Herman, if, you know, hopefully he is convicted, uh, dumped the bodies there. Why were other sex workers there? Because we still have seven other seven or eight other victims that, you know, we still need to uh, not only identify, but also, you know, we need to um, find their killers too. But why, why Gilgo? Why that place during that time period is something that's mystifying. And Sheriff, the commonality also is what you just said, uh, sex workers. Yeah. They were tied together by their profession. And in addition, in a, at a smaller level, they were tied together by the, the booster phones uh, that he was calling them with uh, and also their own cell phones that he used uh, to torture their families, basically. Right. So, yeah, all of those things are unexplained. And I'm hoping that maybe one day if they can't connect these things through uh, investigation that if and when he's convicted, that he'll find the reason at that point to... Uh, to come clean and talk about everything he did. Right. You know, it, it, it's a miss, you know, it's still a, a, an evolving, uh, you know, as you know, an investigation for us. And, you know, there hasn't, other than piecing together uh, for this fourth case with uh, Marlene Brainerd Barnes, uh, you know, trying to tie him, uh, which I think we will be able to uh, successfully do at some point, you know, we still have to look at all of the other victims uh, to see if he is, and if he's not, you know, we definitely have to try and find uh, who is the killer of those those individuals. One hundred percent. And you know, sheriff, one of the, the amazing things, and I've been out uh, this October thirty first. I'll have been retired from the NYPD for twelve years, and I did nearly twenty seven. So when I see what's going on technologically, I'm like, wow, this is unbelievable. With especially investigative genetic genealogy. To me, that is the future, and the future's here. But they're doing amazing things with that technology. You know, and I'm learning because, you know, coming from the correction background, our investigations really uh, stopped at a certain point. And, you know, both of you have seen uh, all types of investigations that I think a lot of people could probably learn from just by listening to you speak or talking about the cases that both of you worked on. So, you know, part of me is learning a lot from not only the DA, but also. Uh, Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison, 
but it all comes together when you uh, sit down and it makes sense just from, uh, you know, I just, I started my career 41 years ago, you know, in 1982 and I've, I've really had the opportunity to learn a lot uh, engaging with the New York City Police Department in not only investigations, I was a supervisor at the Firearms and Tactics Unit. My emergency service uh, tenure uh, went with through your six month emergency service school. So uh, I was lucky to have a lot of good colleagues in the NYPD whose uh, experience uh, and education rubbed off on me uh, to really help me uh, really uh, participate in this investigation from a managerial level. You know, uh, uh, Sheriff Toulon, uh, I, I, you know, it's funny. I liked you from the minute I saw you when you were, uh, uh, you know, doing one of the first shows you did. I, I, I was like, why is a sheriff talking about this case? What the hell is this? And then as I started to listen to you, and I was like, wow, he knows what he's talking about. This is pretty damn good, you know. And uh, all my questions went out, went out, you know. They oh, so yeah, it, it is serving a purpose. Not just not everyone trying to get their thirty seconds of fame, but it was it was really a good thing. And again, we hop on this task force it was probably the greatest thing that they they started with this case. And and the it it bore fruit. You know, it bore fruit. There's no doubt about that. It, it did. And all you know, all the credit uh, I give to Rodney Harrison, Ray Tierney, the New York State Police, and uh, the FBI. You know, as I said, we played a very small role. We're very fortunate to have played a role to, uh, you know, hopefully bring someone to justice. But they all deserve the credit for what they did. And I would gladly step back to say that they're the ones uh, that really helped solve this case. You know, Sheriff, both yourself and Rodney Harrison are two real humble guys. And uh, I appreciate that. And I think it's it's a great thing to be humble. I wish I had more of that in me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but it's just not my personality, but I, I, I really admire that trait. Mike, uh, we kept the sheriff here long enough. Okay. And uh, Sheriff Tulan, I want to thank you so much for coming you. on. You're an amazing guest, but Mike, I'm going to give you your final words. Okay. I just want to say for people who are listening, and, and I, I learned so much from the Gilgo investigation and seeing Sheriff Tulan because I myself also did not expect um, corrections to have you know, be in possession of all of that information. And that, and as you've seen, Sheriff, in your career, the guys that we arrest, they go through your system time and time and time and time again. And the relationships that you build and the information you get can not only help keep your institution safe and your men safe inside the institution and the women safe also, but can also serve to keep people out, out on the street safe. So, Thank you very, very much for all you do. And thank you for coming on tonight and speaking to us. Well, thank you both for your service to uh, New York City. Uh, you know, people like you make my job a lot easier. And, and when we all work together, you know, we can all go home safely. That's right. Absolutely well said. And I think your greatest job, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag right now, was being the bat boy for the New York Yankees in 1979. No one knows that. I let it out of the bag. I'm saying, I'm sure Sheriff Toulon is proud of that too. Folks, thank you so much for listening tonight. Sheriff Toulon, thanks for coming on the show. Mike, thanks for co-hosting. Everyone have a great night from Police Off the Cuff, Real Crime Stories. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. One episode, just ain't enough.